so yeah, I think well, when it comes to you know, as Meryl said, product process automation, it's it's um it's something that I'm very passionate about. And there's the one challenge I've have faced with it is kind of articulating what it is and um and also what problem it's solving. I had this example this weekend where you know I was telling my wife that we've been doing some really cool stuff at work and um it we made some great progress. We got some great feedback from the stakeholders and you know she just turned around and said, I have no idea what you're doing. She just said, I don't know what you do. So that kind of, you know, was, you know, uh, and she 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 works in the financial service industry. She's a chartered accountant herself. So I thought, man, if I can't, you know, I need to be able to articulate it to her. Otherwise, I'm going to really struggle articulating this to anyone. And obviously, bearing in mind uh, the discussion we were having today, I spent some time, you know, thinking about what is it. And I think before delving into, you know, what is a robotic process automation, we need to understand what problem is it solving. So I'm going to take a couple of steps back and go, Let's let me first try and define what is the problem, right? So, so you know, you, you, many of you will have some different backgrounds where you come from, but but if you if you generally if you take a look at organisations, um, even from small to large, you have quite a complicated set of um, software architecture that exists, right? And that 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 compl- you know that complexity exists for a number of reasons. It can be legacy software that exists and has always been in place. There may have been mergers that happened. There could have been you know sales. There could be different applications being used by different geographic locations. But the moral of the story is that at the end, you even in small organizations, you have a different set of software that's designed for different things. And what that what that leads to is, you know, this software is not necessarily designed to be able to interact with each other properly. And as a result, you have to, there's a lot of manual processes that that need to need to be done that kind of patch these things together. Um, and I mean, if I, you know, I can take an, uh, an example that we have, for instance, um, us being quite a, you know, a big organization, something you would think something as simple as leave management would be quite simple. But in our case, it's actually quite complicated. We have about three or four different internal applications that do various parts of the leave management process. Um, so something as simple, you know, at us as checking a leave balance can actually become quite, quite a challenging thing. You'd need to go and pull something from system A, probably have to pull it into to Excel, do a couple of things, then probably pull a forecast from system B, um, and then probably have an internal think about any, un, you know, any unbooked leave that you do plan on taking to kind of get a proper view on, on what is happening in leave. And, you know, that is, that's kind of something that I think, you know, many of you can attest to is you have a lot of these processes where, you know, there's a lot of user, there's a lot of kind of, um, it's, they're, they're homogenous and the things that need to happen before a decision can be made, right? And, you know, just, just to, you know, give you some background, before I, I remember before I'd started my, my career, I always had this view of, you know, organizations like banks um, being, you know, on the front foot of technology, being kind of, you know, everything is nice and shiny. And then once I started auditing them and started looking at the back, you know, I kind of saw that, you know, it's actually, it's not as as pretty as I thought it would look like from the from the inside. And you know, on some of our clients, and some of the bigger you know national uh, banks that we audit on, they have an application landscape of three to four hundred different applications that do various parts of the process, right? So that's quite a it's it's quite a, a nightmare to manage, and leads to quite a you know some strange. Um, it leads to kind of a lot of problems that we have. I mean, um, you know, some of the problems that that you have is things like you have reconciliation differences, right? You have system A says we have 110 clients, but system B says, according to system B, we have 125. Why Why? Why is that? Why is there inconsistency? In, 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 and now we need to go do a whole manual process in terms of reconciling all of this data. You have time-consuming activities, which are very repetitive, so it takes employees' times to do it, and it's just something that needs to happen, let's say, for the, at the end of each workday, a couple of things need to happen. System A, take an extract, do some stuff in Excel format, and then perhaps email a couple of stakeholders, right? So this is this, this problem means there's a lot of inefficient processes and a lot of repetition, okay? Now, so that's kind of the, the, the big part of the, that is a problem that you have. Now, if we go and look at what is the, what is the most, what is one of the solutions that have existed um, for, you know, since the dawn of systems have existed is to basically change, upgrade, and consolidate systems, right? So it sounds like a very simple simple solution. Just build a new system and fix it. But if any of you have had any experience in what major change looks like, um, it is probably one of the most expensive things an organization can go through. It uh, takes a really long time. Um, it's very stressful. And um, 
if we just take uh, recently, we had a big um, uh, system upgrade uh, for EY globally. Now, this system had been in development for eight years and it cost something in the billions of dollars um, to develop, right? So, and that's just, I mean, even on a, on a small and smaller, smaller companies, you have the same thing to go and it, it's very expensive. You need to go and hire a bunch of developers or you'll probably have to outsource it to third parties. So the long-term solution to our initial problem is very expensive and it's slow, right? And that's where you go. You almost have another problem, right? You have a problem, a good solution, but that solution has its own problem in that it's very expensive and slow. Um, this, that is kind of the space that robotic process automation, in my view, is is filling, right? And I'm gonna gonna talk to you a little bit about why that is, right? So firstly, we come to what is what is robotic process automation, and again, you're gonna have a lot of different definitions, but in in my view, trying to kind of keep it in its purest form, it's it's a it's a toolbox of complementary software that is designed to interact with other software. Now, and at its base. It's easier to use and doesn't require a significant amount of programming skill in order to use this. Right? And uh, what it, what you essentially have, uh, you have um, software robots um, or virtual workers. So we prefer, I prefer the term virtual workers. It's got a, you know, uh, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, I remember Mariel talked about the the, the kind of cultural um, angle of this that we can, that we'll cover, but. Bots has a, has a lot of neg negative connotations associated. So we virtual worker is you know someone that's in, in your virtual team that assists you with some tasks. So so that's that's to me in a nutshell what it is. And it's gonna I'll give you some more context in terms of examples because um, that's that's the easiest way to do this. Now from a cost perspective, it costs um it's it's significantly costs a lot less. less um, than major change. And the reason for this is there's quite a there's been some big technological leaps made in the availability of um, process automation software, right? So if you take back 20 years ago, pr process automation was predominantly done through backend development, depending on, you know, with databases involved. So now you have um, platforms like uh, Blue Prism, UiPath, Automation Anywhere, maybe terms that you've heard of before, but those are kind of three of the big front runners in terms of um, process automation software, and you'll you'll see if you take take a look at that software, they are it's it's pretty much workflow driven. It's it's if you if you just think about something like Microsoft Visio that you you drag activities to it and you assign some some basic tasks to it, it's really simplified the the creation of an automation, right? And so just just to give some context, like I do, I don't have a background in, uh, prior programming background at all. I've already made an up, a, a couple of pretty successful automations just by you know being following some of the online learning that's available and just through trial and error and some determination, as well as a couple of members in my team. All none of them are from background, uh, sorry, programming backgrounds, but we have already kind of started building up that internal skill set. Right? Um, there's the hosting costs of these. Um, of these platforms are really not expensive. They're not high intensity. Um, it doesn't require a lot of processing power. I mean, it relies on the processing power that already exists. Right, and again, I'm gonna give you an example just now. Um, and in terms of time, this is probably one of the biggest uh, savings. So due to it being a lot easier to build these automations, the deployment time is very quick and it's very agile. Um, the this this architecture sits on top of your existing architecture. So in other words, this to, to start putting some automations in place doesn't require any changes to your existing applications. You wouldn't need to go and do any additional configurations. You might have to grant um, some access rights uh, to, to, to an automation account. That's pretty much it. So that means your time to get this from the ground up and running is a lot faster than major change. Major change, you know, this doesn't take away the need for major change, but as I've said, you know, um, when you have a, a major change that takes eight years in development, that's eight years of inefficient processes that you're carrying, which potentially could have been, you know, put in a, a, a slightly more efficient um, environment while this major change was happening. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, and again, I've, I've mentioned the, the the easy to use tools, um, and a lot of these. Um, uh, 
a lot of these things like UI Path and Blue Prism, they have a lot of online free training. They are they have uh, they have kind of studio editions that that you can use without uh, any licensing required, just to test it out. And we found that um, to be to be quite um, quite simple to use. Now, so so if we take if we take a look at bit of the, the internal journey that we had at EY and how did this whole thing get started? Um, it was it was you know it was probably a year and a half ago where I was you know sitting and looking at you know a lot of our inefficient processes that we had that were again homogenous, mundane, and and, and a specific example was um, um and whenever we work with a with a, with a, another client we need to do just like any any anybody with third parties that we need to do an engagement letter or it's like a service level agreement right so what we have is we have a template that we need to follow. And there's a couple of fields that need to be populated. Um, that's the client name, what's the fee, what's the duration, a couple of other things. But it's it's actually very little additional information that needs to go in. However, our process was very manual. We have a, you know, we had a template that's saved on a shared drive somewhere. It's maybe updated every now and then. It's updated as required. When someone engages with a new client and they've done all the onboarding and KYC due diligence, we issue the letter. So they have to, a person has to go and go and find this, this template. Then he has to open it up in Word. He has to go and look at where are the places that I need to fill in this information. He, needs to, he or she needs to manually type this in. And then they, you know, we, we did an internal survey to see how much time do people spend doing engagement letters. And we kind of saw that it took, through the whole cycle, it took about, you know, between three and five hours on average to do this this process because it needs to go through a couple of layers of review. So we said, I said, look, this is something that should be fairly easy to 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 automate. Um, it will, it's got two benefits. It's going to reduce, um, it's going to increase the efficiency. So that's a, a, a you know a cost saving. However, it's also going to reduce our risk of creating engagement letters that look inconsistent, right? So whenever you'll see, whenever you get to automations, you can have a. It's either it's either primarily reducing risk or primarily reducing efficiency, but you can have, you know, the other as a byproduct, which is, which is, which is fairly usual. And we went through this process and said, how can we do this? Right. We don't have a development team here. I don't have to develop. I mean, EY has developers, but they, they no, not in our specific function. So we started looking, we, we started looking at this um, software and said, you know, it's, it's actually fairly, fairly easy. There's a couple of things that we needed to do. And essentially, yeah, my team and I built built a, a functional engagement letter automation, and and it was it it was fairly successful. Um, but then, in that journey, this is where we, just like every introduction of new technology has its benefits, it has its challenges at the same time. So one of the first things that we found on our journey was that the actual building of the automation itself was was fairly simple, as I've said. However, there was some additional challenges. Was um, the much more challenging area, which I'd never kind of thought about until we went through it, was the environment that this virtual worker resides on is something that requires a lot more time and thought into it. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on, on what some of those challenges were. So the way the initial automation ran was I had a, we have a kind of secondary laptop here and it was there. And if, if someone needed to run a letter, I would go on there manually, take the, the information from the user uh, and enter it in and click and let the automation run. Now, obviously we said, well, we want this, this must be fully autonomous. We don't want, there shouldn't be any user, user involved. So then we said, but we need some kind of, we need a platform, a, a user interface that people interact with, right? Because if they, you know that's 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 how also users going to interact with this automation. So, and then we started having additional questions. Okay, how are we going to govern access to these automations? Let's say we create a sensitive HR automation that does something, you know, maybe communications of bonus letters. Right? We haven't done that, but it's it's been. What if we did something like that? And you know. Sh we we must be able to restrict who's allowed to do that automation. You know, it should only be people who are authorized to see that information in their day-to-day -day work. Then we started thinking about what about the audit trails of these automations? We need to know who ran an automation, when did they run the automation? Uh, was the automation successful? Did it do what it's supposed to? Because um, one of the things we do monitor is success rates of automations, right? And then we started thinking about, right, but what about, how do we, how, how do we go into that automation project selection? We surely, 
because as as we started internally start um, start on this path, uh, there's the number of ideas and and people that come and say, oh, we need to automate this, we need to automate this. What about this? What about that? There's way more coming in than we have capacity to handle, right? So we need to go. We need to have a process in how we select projects. We can't just go kind of wild west and just start developing left, right, and center. So we need a, we need a governance framework around how this is done. Who authorizes it? Um, how do we test these automations? Right? You know, you can kind of if you come from a, a an IT department background, you can think of you know your normal system development life cycle where you know a project needs it's like any project it needs it needs authorization to start. It needs some tracking and progress and then it needs some testing and then it needs a decision and approval for kind of going live so these were all things that 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 we needed to to take in the, into account then we had things like software choices there's such a wider range of, of of software available and i think something that we saw is process automation is not a single single platform solution there is not there's not like you buy this one product and that's all your problem solved. It's a configuration of a set of different uh, software that exists, and we'll talk about now about kind of the basics that we needed to have put in place. Some of the other challenges we obviously ran into was costs. You know, there is we've mentioned that a big benefit is that it's a lot cheaper than major change, but it's still it's still fairly expensive. Some of the licensing that you require, some of the hosting and infrastructure. And and of course another big thing we 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 needed to do as all projects do we needed to think about how we're going to demonstrate the return on investment because there's been significant investment in this area and we need to be able to accurately account and track this to to prove to the stakeholders that we're not just playing around here making automations we're actually achieving what our goal is and how are we going to accurately record that and then you know a couple of other things data privacy and security also came up. You know, how, how do we know that, you know, only the right people can access the automations from an internal perspective, but is it is it externally exposed? What type of data is being retained and where is it, you know, do we have GDPR considerations here? We definitely do. We need to think about, are we running HR, inf, you know, HR automations? Where's the information being stored? Is it being kept? You know, there's, you know, there's, there's a whole host of things that, that, that we've, the kind of challenges that we've come to. But of course, none of them have been, you know, prohibitive, but there is definitely a lot of um, time and thought that we've been doing on this. And again, back to the original thing, making the automation is is much much more the easier part. It's it's all these other factors that we found we've been spending a lot more time on, and um, that's that's why we spent quite a bit of time this year just trying to get our own foundations right and going before we go and have a whole array of automations in a let's call it an unsafe space. Let's first build the correct foundation, the environment where we can manage all of these things, and then we can start thinking about putting some more automations into into production. Right. Um, so that brings to it's our, so our basic RPA solution. You kind of you, you need at least you need two components. The first is you need your your automation um, platform or provider. So that's one of your things like UiPath. I've mentioned this UiPath, Blue Prism, Automation Anywhere. If you go and Google those names, you'll see there are they they big companies. They are they they are pretty much the three front runners in this. Although there's other there's other um, platforms available as well. Um, so it's good to go and take a look and see. You know, I, there's no personal preference from my side. Um, they're different. The, they can be differently suited to what your organization needs. Um, that's the first step. But the second part, and that's a, bit, a little bit more, the more the more challenging part is you need a, a some type of user interface and back end. Um, you know, I often refer to it as, you know, the mothership kind of that interacts with the automation software and the automations, right? You need something that's sending the instructions or whatever, you know. You know, mothership basically tells the virtual worker, "I need you to run the payroll monthly payroll automation now, right?" So, what is that platform, and and, and what is and how are you doing that? There's 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 many ways to do that, but that's pretty much a, a custom a custom solution. There's currently there's not there's not really a, a something that you can can go and buy off the shelf that that that, that serves in that that kind of orchestrator role. And then there's a couple of optional components. Um, you may have processes that require um, 
ETL or extract transform and load tools, things like Alteryx or Spotfire or, or, or things like that. And you may also want to involve visualization software for some of your automations, things like Power BI, Spotfire again. So those are, so those are some of the, some of the pieces of the puzzle that, that, that we've been making use of to put the automations together. Um, and I think it, it it would be it wouldn't be right to to not talk about um, APIs, um, and I'll go into that as they play a very big role in process automation. Um, so, what an API is, um, you may know or not, um, it's an application programming interface, right? So, basically, it's it's an interface that software developers put on their platforms that enable smooth and easy integration and interfacing with other applications, right? Um, if we take um, UiPath or Blue Prism, for instance, what they have is they've they've built an application and uh, gateway for for instructing the automations. So if you if you connect to the API and you send the correct set of instructions, you can kick off that virtual worker without having to log into the platform. And that is, you know, APIs can make building automations a lot simpler. Um, case in point, one of our one of our um, automations that we built as a, as a proof of concept was, um, you guys know that the, the UK company's house, right? So the UK company's house is a, uh, for UK companies has the company information, share, list of directors and shareholders. You can go and, if you go to the website, you can search that. So, however, we, we noted that they built an API for that functionality. So, we built an, uh, a proof of concept automation that can, if you provide it the company number, it connects to the API and provides you the required information back in an Excel spreadsheet in the format that you want it. Um, so that's something that can only be done, that will, will get made a lot simpler through through APIs. And um, one of the big moves we're kind of seeing, if you've, if you've heard of the term open banking that we're seeing in the banking environment is a a push from from banks to to start moving towards a platform like providing APIs um, for their customers. So what that would that would enable you to do, if you just take one of my pet peeves in my personal life, is that you know I have my, my wife and I we have two different credit cards and we have two different bank accounts. Um, and at the end of each month, when we're just trying to basically want to pull everything together to see you know what has been the damage for this month. It's a really painful process. I need to log into every credit card platform separately, go and download the statement into some provided in PDF, some provided in Excel, some in CSV. I need to go and spend a good two hours consolidating all of this information into an Excel spreadsheet so that I can start doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I've actually been looking a lot to see which of the banks provide APIs because I would much rather... You know, I could even build a spreadsheet that connects to the APIs and just pulls the information and kind of automates that process for me. But that's something that we've seen. There's definitely at corporate level, there's API functionality that's that's starting to be rolled out. But um, I think it's something that will be good to monitor uh, in the space. And then later you could have instruct payments, you could do withdrawals without logging to the platforms. And that's just an example of how APIs... Um, or affecting us and making process automation easier. One of the other ones we ran into is um, there's a there's a, a cloud accounting package called Zero, spelled with a X, so X E R O. So maybe you know of it. So they have an API functionality as well. So you can, for us from from an auditor's perspective, if a client uses the Zero accounting package, they could provide us with a read-only API key, and then we can go and look at information. Uh, without needing to specifically request everything, um, so that's that's just another example of, of how we look at it. So I think, kind of seeing that's almost there at half an hour. So in in conclusion, I think you know for me it's it's an exciting, fast-moving space to be in. Um, there's a lot of opportunities uh, here. Uh, it is something that is, you know, it is it is new. Um, there's not many. I mean, even even myself, so that you, you'll you'll struggle to find people that have. You know, successfully built RPA or delivered RPA projects, especially in the Channel Islands. Um, it's it's definitely an opportunity, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see where this takes us. You know, our internal journey. We have a, a long roadmap ahead of us in terms of what we want to achieve, um, as well as help clients achieve. That's that's um, part of what we do as well. 
So that's that's it. I hope, in a nutshell, I hope it's uh, provided some context, uh, definitely from from my view as to what what we're doing. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing your views and questions. And you know, this is just again, I could talk I could talk about this for hours, but um, I've been I've got my li my limits been given to me. Fantastic. Thank you, Leo. That's great. So I, I mean, what's really interesting to me hearing you talk and it kind of fell into place in my head, I think, is the fact that this is this is a, a little bit of a stepping stone along the way. So we all, we all have this vision of how technology is going to change everything in the future. And the idea that this is a, this is a this is a bit of a gap filler because that future is a very expensive thing that's very difficult to get to. And, and you know, the world will be so dramatically changed. And actually, this is this is a way of kind of getting started on that process. And I, for me, that's a kind of really helpful way to think about this. Um, so please think of questions. I'm just going to kind of kick off with a couple. So, but I'm going to come back out to you guys in a minute for some questions. But I'm just interested to know: Are there some sectors that you think are grasping this earlier than others? Are there sectors that you think are particularly ripe for it or ready for it? Yeah, I think uh, so. I mean, what you know, obviously, my background in terms of sectors is is largely financial services, and um, but obviously, I've seen on the 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 other side the this the the areas I see that are fastest responding to this is is generally, um, especially in the Channel Islands context, is people that um, is organisations where is not the large organisations. Let's put it this way: the large organisations have a lot of. Um, a lot of barriers, a lot of internal protocol, a lot of kind of you know projects already in place um, that uh, that are you know kind of put put in the way and said, look, we don't need another software solution. We've already got five different projects running, so so let's 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 park this. Or we've got this big migration that's going to be happening in the next two or three months. So it's 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 I'm seeing the big a big obstacle at the larger organisations. Um, what we're seeing in terms of if you go what if I just look outside of what I've run into in within the business context, it's just looking at what's happening out there. Is a lot of the, from the banking perspective, so I would say, yes, a lot of financial services companies are doing well, but these are the, uh, these are the challenger banks. If you, any of you guys know about the bank called Revolut, you know, it's a startup challenger bank. They are very much, you know, because they don't have this, this legacy, they don't have this kind of, you know, a hundred year, history of how we do things so they're able to respond much quicker to this the other area where i've seen a lot of adoption on this is um cryptocurrency um, exchanges because again cryptocurrency is such a new thing again they don't have all of this legacy if you go to any of these crypto exchanges they all have application programming interfaces they have you know they have modern you know modern user user interfaces and platforms for other software to connect to so um, yeah, I think I think uh, it's 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 hard. It's again, it's hard to say. There's there's no real measure to say. You know, how has the adoption of this of this been taken over, uh, or, or you know, who's doing better in this space? Because there's no real there's no way to measure it currently. Um, but yes, that's you know, from my view, the the kind of areas where I've seen okay. you know, organizations respond to it. Okay, and just one more, and then I'm going to come back out. So I'm intrigued about whether there is software out there to help spot opportunities for this. Is there is there software out there which can um, machine learn, you know, use artificial intelligence to say there are these repetitive processes happening across these multiple platforms? Because it's actually quite hard. You have a bit of a mental block when you sit down and think about what are the things that we could do. Now, you said there are thousands, but I'm sort of thinking through what I do and thinking, actually, I'm struggling to think of them. And it, actually, software could help me do that. Is there anything out there to do that? Yeah, you know, it's it's so where we are in terms of things like machine learning and that we we're very much, you know, it's a part of this 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 evolution and the, the stepping stone is 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 where we are is looking at manual processes. So that already tells you. So because a lot of the stuff is processes that reside outside of systems makes it very hard from a systems point of view so for an application. So if you think, you know, you're asking, is there some type of software that I can run on my organization that I click a button and it tells me, yes, I found 20 processes that are very uh, manual. Um, that definitely doesn't exist because it's a very manual process in, in terms of identifying, right? So one of the, one of the key things that we've, you know, that we've assisted clients with and had to do internally is that whole, is basically we call it project identification. Right, and you usually do that on a on a by department process. So, for instance, we would go to uh, an HR department, 
and you would start and go, let's have a discussion about where are, what are the, what is the landscape of manual processes that you do? Let's run through your, your kind of, you know, per role, what are your responsibilities? What do you do on a day-to-day basis? And through that process, you basically start mapping out where are the opportunities. And once you've, once you've got that, you go through basically calculating the impact of, possibly automating it as well as the potential you know whether it's a risk reduction or a return on investment right so yeah that's it's unfortunately there's no like kind of magic solution to to click the the the, the challenge is the best the people best placed to know what are the what the automations or the potential automations are, are the people that work and do those tasks on a day-to-day basis so yeah it would be great if there was like this uh, this magical uh, um you know, thing that could just tell you where to automate, but actually, that's one of the most challenging questions to answer. Is even if you've got a solution in place, is right? What processes do we start with? But we always kind of go start with the low-hanging fruit. Start with something that is, that is, you know, don't don't bite off something super complex. Just take it. You know, we took we took that engagement letter because it's something that we knew was done a lot, and we knew it wasn't the execution of it was not very complicated. So you know, you start small, and then later coming back to things like um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, once you have the basic processes kind of done and automated in a place where you know it's being reliably executed, then you can start looking at, you know, where are there places where we're, where humans and, and users are still making decisions and start looking at, is that is that the next step of our automation journey is looking at the basic decisions that we can start looking at, you know, in this process path, should it go, you know, left or right, a user currently decides, but you could use historic data to start building an algorithm that says, based on a couple of factors, we know this is the decision to take. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Perhaps one question is, which are the really boring bits of your job? Perhaps that's the way to go about doing it when you start. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it's even it's, it's your job and as well, I mean, if you're managing people, um, you just need to think it's pretty simple. You start looking at it like, if, you're, if you have a process that involves you opening up um, an Excel spreadsheet, that's probably going to be a good place to start because it, it most likely involves, um, you know, obtaining data from a source, doing a couple of steps in Excel, um, you know, to get it right because the extract is not 100% correct. And then maybe you need to go and email that on to a couple of people. That's, you know, that, that's take a look at things that are pulling information from systems, doing a, a light level of kind of staging or manipulation and then moving it on in the process. That's That's kind of how how we how we've approached it here and i think what you'll find is you know what we also noticed here is once that kind of onboarding of you know the virtual workers and automations happens the the ideas start coming like because people start realizing look this is helping because it's not it's it's not kind of it's helping me do your job better because if you just take something like um for one of the things I have to do frequently on engagements that I run is I need to I need to know how much time we've spent on a certain engagement. You know who's who spent so many hours and what is our budget. Now currently, you know it needs I need to pull it from a system. Then I need to put it into an Excel spreadsheet. Then I need to select these, delete two rows, add another uh, sorry, delete two columns. Then I need to do a pivot table, and then I can see what's been charged, right? So that is something that's, you know, an, an automation from, from a personal point of view is, is quite simple to make. It just does does what I do. It logs into system A, clicks a couple of buttons, pulls that, pulls that report out, does what I need to do so that I can just do the actual decision-making part instead of spending an hour or two, you know, creating the information that's needed for the decision. Let the human do what the human does best. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So out to you guys. Any questions, any thoughts? Um, I suppose picking up on your question there, at the end of when, when you spoke the, your your synopsis at the beginning, you, you ended up by saying it's difficult to find examples in the Channel Islands, and there may be reasons for that. Maybe because it's early days, mm. maybe because the companies don't have the resources and the skills to actually execute any of this. Um, maybe you know there are other there are other factors around. Um, you know, risk or something, perhaps people are risk averse generally in, in this industry or in this, in this geography. So bearing that in mind, do you, do you agree with any of those um, factors or do you think there are other factors? And what would you say the community as a whole should be doing to accelerate this and, you know, give people the opportunity to understand where it might make a difference, a positive difference? The things that you would recommend that we do in the islands, apart from today, as an example of one of those things. 
you could, could you right, you can. You can. Yes, yes, I got that. So I've got there's kind of two questions. The one is, you know, uh, wh wh why do we think we're a little bit slow in adoption? Um, and the second one is, what should we be doing? Um, you know, what should we be doing uh, here? So, so quickly, you know, in terms of, in terms of, it's hard to say if we're if we're behind or not, right? Because this is not something, it's not the kind of a metric that an organization reports. It, it's not like someone has a, there's not like a process automation maturity scale. Um, if you think about something like cybersecurity, that's something where you can actually get, uh, you know, someone like EY or someone else, you can go, please do a cybersecurity maturity assessment for me. And you will get a report that says, you know, from your physical access, you're on a three out of five maturity. So you'll know where you are. But uh, in terms of automation, that's, that's you know, it, it doesn't currently exist yet. But I mean, yes, if you ask me from my view, I think, I think there are some challenges that we have that are not new to channel analysis, but we've always had. We have, um, we have, you know, some resourcing constraints. I think, I think that's definitely something because we've, I've mentioned that it's, there's things that makes it easier, but there's still, there's still a level of, there's still some, especially in creating the environment and the foundation, there's definitely a, te a kind of a, a technical level of competence required at the base to get a project started. And that's, you know, uh, in, in the channel and is, is what we've seen is it's quite tough finding the right the right people to to do to do that so so I think you know I definitely think we are there's there's more that can that can be done so if we, if we move on to kind of you know what would what would I do uh, I'm sorry and one of the things you mentioned you said you know is it maybe something about risk appetite right and I think what so if, if you think just a, an organization like EY you know we have a a pretty low risk appetite as it is. We're, we're a firm that's you know been here for, for a long time and we don't want to do anything that's going to you know cause any reputational damage or any anything in that line. But we have found that a lot of these things will actually result in a net risk reduction from an internal point of view. If we take um, some of the processes, you know, for, for, for instance, our engagement letter, it's actually... Um, it's going to be. It's going to increase the level of consistency we have with with the engagement letters that we issue. Um, so it's it's actually an overall risk reduction that we've that we've we've taken into account. So I think I think if you do take a look at this, you know, if you take a look at the number of manual, you know, there's a lot of risk in manual processes, especially you know if you take a, a, a for instance um, a regulatory reporting. A lot of that is is. Um, you need to take a, a whole host of inf uh, information from a set of systems, do a whole bunch of manual things to get them into the right format that, that the regulator wants. Um, and, you know, if the more, the, the more manual some of those things are, there's, a, there's always that risk of human error. Um, so, so yes, I think from a, you can, you can definitely get it on a net risk reduction um, basis. That's, that's definitely how we viewed it from an, from an internal um, perspective here. And then, you know, if you ask what, what more can be done in this, I think, you know, I, I would encourage the, the kind of thing that we did, right? We didn't, we just started, just started looking at, at um, you know, what the, what the type of things that we, we can automate. And it's not like on day one, we said we need to go and spend 200,000 pounds to, to buy all of the stuff. We just said, right, there's, there's software available that we, can, that we can take a look at. Why don't we run a proof of concept exercise? Why don't we see if it, if it, if it does what it's supposed to do? And the initial upfront investment on that was, was just time because it was, you know, we, under the licensing agreements for, for that, uh, for, for UiPath, you can go and test the software out. So I would just encourage, you know, giving it a try. So I wouldn't, when I say give it a try, I wouldn't just go build an automation and, you know, launch it live and, say great that's working but you know do a proof of concept that runs concurrently with the process and you kind of give that feedback and you, know, you give that um, hand that back to the user to say is this making your life easier yes or no and in, in all our cases we've found that the answer is yes we go you know this used to take you four hours um, so now it's taking you know it takes you five minutes and you can spend an hour actually just reviewing this letter instead of four hours compiling it um, so you know, it's, 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 I've always been a, of a view of just kind of getting your hands a little bit dirty at the start, just, just dig into it. It doesn't require a lot of, a lot of upfront investment to see if, the, how, if the proof of the proof of concept will work. Ultimately, that's, that's what I did internally to get stakeholder buy-in. So I, I took a simple process, which I was tired of doing myself and spent some time, um, to put, put something in place. Then we started showing it around and we got, you know, we got that um, 
buy-in from the the partner group here to say this is this is powerful stuff and uh, we um we definitely want more of it and we 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 kind of we we're happy to put some some more um investment to this to get this thing properly launched so that's that's what i'd say is just you know kind of I, i've but you know i've always been a view i don't want to wait for someone to tell me to do something i just do it and you know do it and see if it uh, see if it works and uh, then you get the buy-in so um it's very simple to to do a proof of concept um that's i would just say give, get your hands dirty a bit and then you'll start seeing you know whether it's you know viable and what the challenges are you'll run into very much with some of the same things that we have done Sounds like it's, it's really about picking the right thing. As you say, the low hanging fruit, pick something really simple that you can start with where human decision is, is, is really not part of the process at all. Um, so that the risk of doing it is as low as it can possibly be. Um, I would say. Yeah. So as, a, as an example, right, we have a, we have a process, so, you know, at the end of our annual review cycle internally. So what happens is, you know, people get promoted and, and uh, people get salary increases and um, you basically at the end of the day, um, HR has an Excel spreadsheet and what they need to do is they ind- need to individually email people and say, look, this is, this is now what, what, what is, what's, what's happened and what's going to, what's going to happen going forward. Now that's an extremely, you know, that's quite, it's quite a manual process and it's got quite, you know, it's got some sensitive information in it. Um, I mean, if the person doing that is a bit tired and you know, you're on your 100 and 129th email where you're just copying and pasting something from a spreadsheet into an email, you know, not, not anything has gone wrong in the past but it's something that is it's so simple it's just an excel spreadsheet with all you need is an excel spreadsheet with the email addresses and uh, an automation can go and send those and you'll know that there's you know there's a much there's, there's you've reduced the risk of this information going to the wrong hands and it's not a complex automation at all okay thank you has that answered your question yeah it, it did yeah, yeah. just uh, as a follow-up if i may just, yeah please do. do you think there's anything that governments or quangos or regulators should be doing to make it attractive for the private sector to go down this route by the way in which they technically interact using apis and things i'm looking at examples of say jfsc and gfsc as to how you can share data with them is there more that should be done from that side you know i think there's there's always, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm of the view from a technological point of view, there's always more that can be done. It's just about getting the balance right, right? So I think currently it feels like, from, from my perspective, the onus is very much on kind of the, the organizations themselves currently, right? Um, that's, that's where the low-hanging fruit initially are. But at the same time, you know, if you just think about, so if I, I was just thinking back in here in Jersey, we still submit, you know, tax returns on a piece of paper and we'll fill it in with a pen. Um, that that doesn't lead me to think, you know, there is, there's definitely something that can be done from both sides to, to, to kind of be able to meet in the middle. Yeah, if you think about something like a, a return for the regulator, it would be great if you could um, if you could submit some of that stuff through APIs or request some information through APIs. So that's that's kind of what the FRC did in the UK with Companies House, right? They provided an application programming interface, and it makes people's lives easier. You can kind of build your software to accommodate it. But I, so I think there's there's always more that can be done. But I wouldn't say I wouldn't say like from like let's say from an EY perspective, there's the the thing that's holding us back internally is us, as in us. We need to spend time. We need to get with the program and. It's not, you know, we're not, it's not, it's not a, there's not a regulatory or government uh, reason that's preventing us from doing this. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, just out of opinion. Um, so uh, a lot of the RPA stuff can be, um, the drivers are more from the business rather than the technology. Yeah, uh, H-Balance, you've got a IT department. Drivers are coming from the business itself. Um, but as you said early on, you've got access to a development team, but they're busy uh, and don't really have the effort to take this on. Um, but the hard part is not actually doing the automation. The hard part is, and just to list a few things you mentioned, environment, authorization, triggers, audit logs, uh, error rate, success rate, testing. Um, and it, this is all starting to sound like a development team. Uh, to run this, but what risk is there to companies of essentially having a shadow development team that runs under the radar of the IT budget and the governance of IT departments, etc.? 
Um, very high, I would say, <laughs> because uh, it's um, it's definitely something that can be done. Because some of this, um, y there's nothing to stop one someone from a from an organization to go to www.uipath.com, download the community edition, uh, build an automation, and have it operational. Um, there's nothing that that would detect it, which which again kind of comes back to the you know the this process that was exactly the thing that we started seeing here we said this can very quickly turn into a decentralized wild west environment right um, where you have a whole bunch of people doing whatever they think is right automating stuff that you don't even have vision of right we go we we, we you know there may be automations that exist that we're not even aware of so so there's there's a there's a risk there's there's definitely that risk and i think that's why it's about pr proactively kind of putting the platform a platform and environment in place where yeah you're right it, it pretty much is a, a a solution that needs to be run from it in terms of the back end but but it's all about getting the governance right and if you provide if you know you're right the drivers come from business because it's them sitting with these processes yes it may have some processes but um it's predominantly coming from business so it's it's about giving them uh, providing a platform where they can do these automations um that's that's you know a balance of you know prohibitive in terms of you know approvals and things that need in place but still enough that you know from a risk perspective you've got that risk managed so yeah to answer your question it, it's it's different and, and i would i would be i would be surprised if it's not already happening at at places because again it's it's the same as whether you i mean the same risk existed if you had an excel spreadsheet with macros written in right so you could have an excel spreadsheet some guy learned taught himself how to write some macros you don't have a register of all the spreadsheets necessarily in your kind of in your remit that have macros but that's essentially a piece of code that's that's sitting outside of the control of the it department yeah no indeed um and what it feels like is that IT departments need to be embracing this rather than just saying that we're too busy. We need to be, they need to be embracing that and saying, this is gonna happen whether we like it or not. So try to maybe bring this under the control of IT rather than letting the Wild West, as you said, because IT departments spent decades trying to hoover up Excel spreadsheets and random access databases that uh, been uh, cropping up all over the business, trying to bring it into a more centralized and governed arena. And now there's just another tool to add to this wild west approach. Yeah, that's that, that's exactly it. And it's about I think you know being proactive because I think you know essentially it's it's going to start happening. Um, it's it's going to happen. And if you're proactive on it, then that's kind of where the whole kind of the cultural angle comes to you know to get this you know to get to get an automation kind of project underway get the buy in but again like i said this is this is not this is something that it will be it's it's it's, it's as good as having a, a a new platform so there'll be new resources it's it's not something which you know like it department you've got your day job right it's not that we've got capacity to just go and build a new a new uh, a new platform here to manage the stuff so so um, it will require some 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 investment and it's also a rich source of information, isn't it? So if this is a stepping stone to the future, which is something different, there's a fantastic set of requirements being potentially collected through through these automations. I think the CEO mentioned there is a, um, well, once you say there's no RPA maturity assessment, there is a level of maturity that should be thought of because RPA can be considered a stepping stone to uh, better forms of automation. Uh, in the future, uh, and by IT departments actually embracing that, they get a chance to potentially uh, come in in the future Indeed. and control this transformation part. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, if you think about it, look, there's always going to be a stepping stone, right? It's never, you're never going to fully arrive from a technological point, right? There's always going to be a transition phase and something like this will always kind of catch those temporary processes, those temporary things, um, even let's say let's like like for us we had a, a big migration from system A to system B, so we've put a couple of automations in place to bridge that period. But now there's always the next thing, right? There's the next. Now we've done with our finance. Now we need to move on to our HR system that needs to go and do something. So again, there's the, there's always going to be a platform for for agile agile development essentially. Questions? So yeah, when talking about the benefits of this, it sounds. Uh, a little chaotic when you talk about not consolidating systems and instead building this. 
uh, I think with any change, uh, there's, you know, looking at processes, there are non-standard exceptions of these processes, perhaps bad processes to begin with. So you wouldn't want to recreate the bad process. Is there a role uh, of AI in this, in identifying the bad processes and identifying the improvements to all of them? I wouldn't say, I would, perhaps in the future there will be a, a, a place for AI in this. I think, you're, but you're right, uh, currently actually there's a balance between just automating a bad process, right? Actually a big part of this is actually, that's why the people that are getting involved is why the business needs to get involved in business analysts. Um, part of this is also process re-engineering, right? Um, what what you actually will find is sometimes you, you, you can, a, a process that's been, quite old we've always been doing this for the last 10 or 20 years when you actually bring it up for for potential automation you look at it and you go actually this we're not just going to automate this we're actually going to re-engineer this at the same time um there may be some redundancies that have come in place um so so you know you're, you're right in terms of you don't just automate everything for the sake of automating it um there needs to be there's a lot more factors in project selection than just oh it can be automated therefore it should that's that's you know, that way, again, you, it, it can be quite chaotic if you're just automating things that don't have a place. You know, I've, I've had it where people come, I've got a great idea for an automation um, because, it's you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Then if I look at it, I go, you yeah, know, well, number one, the ultimate impact of this is one user, just you, because it's just one job that you have. It's its wider impact is, is virtually nothing. So all that's going to make your life easier. For us, from a time and time investment point of view, it's just not going to make sense. Um so there's there's a lot of cases. This project selection is very important here uh, because, again, you can have the right platform, the right tools, but you're selecting the wrong projects, and you're ultimately going to have a, a in an overall project that's not looking very great at the end. Okay, I mean, I've, just, I've got one final kind of question from me about kind of bigger picture, I guess. So impact on Jersey and Guernsey, you know, the Channel Islands and the kind of services that we have around financial services in particular, is this a threat? I mean, is it, is it going to mean far less people are required to do the same job? So are we going to have lots more unemployed? So, I mean, if, you, if, if we take a look at that, this is, and I've, I've obviously thought about this a lot, you know, what is the, what is the impact going, you know, going to be? Um, so Jersey, we, we know, Jersey and Guernsey, we've been subject to resource challenges. This is nothing new. We have resource and skill shortages for, for a very long time. And there's been other solutions in place to alleviate that. If I just think about um, offshoring and outsourcing, right? There's been a lot of, a lot of the larger places have, you know, they have a lot of their functions don't necessarily reside in Jersey or Guernsey. Um, so, so those exercises have already taken, um, already happened. That was because they would have used the exact same rationale, right? They would have gone, we are the easy processes that we don't need people in the Channel Islands. We can do it in a different location. And, and a lot of that has already happened. And I think the, a lot of the starting of the low hanging fruit will actually, you know, it's, it's, and we've definitely seen that at us internally. Some of the processes that we've been automating, they haven't been, they've been impacting some of the stuff that have been done by different locations because, you know, we go, why do we need someone sitting all the way on the other side of the world to do this process for us when we can have an automation that does, does the same. But I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a bit of an isolated um, incident. I, I, I think, yeah, I think it will, there's, you know, as, as one door, I think it's, you know, with technology, how it usually happens, as one door opens, another one, uh, one closes, sorry, another one opens, right? So this, that's why I kind of like to look at it, at the opportunity side, you know, these, there may be processes that are going to be, you know, um, automated, which will reduce the overall FTE or full-time employee count that organizations will have. But again, there's an opportunity for, you know, there's a whole host of new roles being created. You need RPA architects. We need you need people to data privacy impact assessments. We need cybersecurity experts. Who's you know how are we managing these automations? How are we keeping them secure? Which automations do we select? Um, but you know, it's it, it's hard to say what the what the overall impact will. But it will it will have an impact. That's uh, that's 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 for sure. And I think um, it's about you know, for for me and for for my team, it's about kind of trying to see where is this going and and trying to stay ahead of the curve in terms of, you know, we want to be seen as, you know, leaders in this field. We this is this is a new th it's it's a new opportunity. It's it's and, and it's something that I think can play a, a pretty big role in um 
you know, from a, from a channel analyst perspective. Okay, great. Okay. And one more thing, Leo, where, I mean, for people in the room who want to know more, where should they go? Where can they, where can they find out more after? I mean, for, for me, it's a, it's, it's, so I would, I would start looking at those, the, the automation platform websites. That's where I looked. I started, I mean, I started looking at UiPath, Blue Prism, Automation Anywhere. Um, they are all three great platforms. They're all three, um, have a lot of a lot of rich information there's a lot of information on youtube there's i i pretty much taught myself through youtube and and um some of the academies provided and just to do some some of the the basic automations um that's kind of the first step because you need to kind of get your hands dirty and see what are we working with here and then you'll start going into the the, the other questions around platforming and you know the other challenges and um there it's it's a it's you'd probably go you know you it's a more traditional it challenge that needs to be needs to be solved but you know if you if you're at that stage um you know you're welcome to reach out to me to have a conversation it's 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 you know the first part is just getting yourself acquainted with the type of stuff that is out there and then you'll you'll see what the kind of next steps would be Fantastic. That's, I mean, I, it is a fascinating subject. I can see why it's the favorite part of your job. It's, it's, it's both technical and interesting and, and sort of broad societal kind of um, fascinating in that way as well. So thank you very much, Leo. Yeah. No problem. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Leo. And uh, thanks very much for taking time to facilitate this uh, event today for us. I'm just pumping to mention the events recorded, so I'm going to have, we're going to have our GCA website, so if you've got any colleagues that you wanted to, to and then that will be available in the field a week or so time. Um, you'll also be asked to, get to give us some feedback, particularly obviously interested in what, what your feedback thoughts are, but topics as well for us, many topics that you'd really like to see around digital leadership and, and the digital theme, then please let us know because you're the people that are best place to advise us on what you'd like to see. Um, and also mail out future live stream events to you unless you let me know otherwise if you can. So if you don't want me to send you um, information about future events and just let me know about why make sure you get to keep with these as they continue um, this year and on all through to next year. So, okay, thank you very much for your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll speak to Thanks. you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, okay. I'll drop you an email. Bye. 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 Bye.